So one of the advantages of going towards the end is you can kind of summarize stuff that everyone has been talking about because everybody already talked about a lot of this stuff on my slides. So that's what I'm going to do to some extent and then talk about some new results that my group has been working towards for the past few months. I just want to start with saying thank you to Hossein and Marcus for inviting me. You guys have watched me grow up, never vertically. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, there, are, you know, there's a lot of people here who have done some amazing experiments, and uh, one of the key themes of this workshop is all these uh, AMO folks who have been working towards super precise measurements of this died um, <laughs> these things and beyond how can we push things in cosmology where there are so many open questions and uh, you know orders of magnitude of uncertainty so please let me know if these numbers have improved and I think I saw one or two slides of these numbers improving uh, we know time to you know uh, questionably age of the universe, but uh, pretty much age of the universe. We can measure super tiny B fields using uh, magnetometry with uh, atomic spins, uh, yocto newton force sensing, but I should say that using big mechanical objects, we do zepto-newton, atto-newton all the time. Uh, super tiny displacements, even with big objects, and uh, very, very small masses, and yet, there are a lot of, with all those decimal, uh, you know, significant figures, we still don't know um, anything about dark matter and dark energy, which is 95% of our known universe. So um, these are three problems that I wrote down that have showed up as a sort of motivation for a whole range of experiments. So I'm just going to repeat them. There are a couple of what I would lump them together as tuning problems in, uh, in physics. One is the hierarchy problem, why is gravity so weak? So quantum gravity takes over at Planck scale, which is 16 orders of magnitude below electroweak. Why is that the case? I don't know, do you? But uh, this is the motivation of doing you know, big G things with the little objects. Uh, the strong CP problem, why have we not seen any violation of CP symmetry for strong nuclear interactions? And it may have implications in baryogenesis. Basically, why is there more matter than antimatter? And uh, the cosmological constant problem, my favorite theory problem, because uh, it talks about how little theory we know. Um, <laughs> that uh, the calculated zero point energy density from QFT calculations, and we know these kind of things happen because Casimir, everybody, uh, <laughs> is uh, 10 to the 120 times bigger than the observed vacuum energy density, so the cosmological constant problem. And uh, the reason I brought this up is that I'll be talking about dark matter candidates and uh, theories that talk about solutions to this kind of problem came up with WIMPs as a corollary and they were good dark matter candidates. Theories that discuss solutions to this problem came up with QCD axions as, you know, basically a corollary to this problem. And uh, there was some talk about moduli and dilettons, um, kind of uh, bosonic fields. And these come out of string theory uh, framework that is looking into this problem, I would also like to say, as my particle physics colleague pointed out to me, that these aren't the only dark matter candidates. There are so many more. So <laughs> a whole bunch, of, especially um, especially for you know ultralight boson searches, there's a whole bunch of axionic um, candidates that don't come out of solutions to this problem, but are pretty legitimate. And uh, so there's a whole big zoo of, you know, well-motivated candidates for dark matter that spans too many orders of magnitude. So going back to uh, precision measurements, basically, there are two types of awesome quantum systems because these are the two types of awesome quantum systems we know how to solve and control. The spin or atomic type systems 
great for you know frequency and B field kind of uh, measurements, and uh, and then harmonic oscillator systems. And today I am a completely harmonic oscillator girl. Uh, I will only talk about mechanical systems. And these are great for, you know, force sensing. You talked about acceleration uh, sensing 10 to the minus 9G uh, per square hertz and uh, small displacements and small masses. All right, so Dave already barred this up. There's a whole bunch of mechanical systems that people have been working on. And uh, I'll be talking about pretty much things in this regime and how they can be used to constrain some of the parameter space from uh, for some dark matter candidates. Okay, so I'm a theorist, and so all harmonic oscillators are created equal, and this is the equal thing. If you have a more fancy elastic object, so not a point mass, which is basically everything in life, everybody gets an N, so you have to worry about what is the effective mass here. The dissipation for different modes, obviously eigenfrequency, and uh, for the kind of forces that I will talk about due to scalar dark matter field or continuous gravitational waves, the type of mechanical modes you pick, they matter because the coupling can be zero if you choose the wrong mode. So, so these are like slightly geometry dependent forces, but there are some classic scalings and stuff. So basically, we need to beat different types of noise. For all the theory work that I will show, because they involve, at least some of them, involve very different mechanical systems, I am, and I wanted to compare them, I have kind of decided they're all at 10 millikelvin, and uh, they're limited by thermal noise. Because then it's like, you know, like, how do you compare? So, so I'm trying to reduce uh, all the technical parameter space, basically. So if you think of um, some extended elastic object and some external force that is kind of you know, stretching it, squeezing it, doing stuff to it, you induce uh, a strain perturbation. And the type of strain, uh, and this is where some of the details come in, uh, basically uh, the strain perturbation and the external tidal force that it leads to depends on the mode geometry that you have for your extended elastic object. So, for example, and you know, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, I will uh, talk about scalar dark matter candidates, and uh, in this case, in this case, uh, the strain fields, uh, so this will be isotropic strain field. It's the, the same kind of coupling, whether you look in this direction or this direction. Well, there's the, you know, uh, the dark matter wind direction and all that. But over time scales of dark matter wind not changing, basically this kind of coupling would uh, give you strains that are that are basically, you know, breathing modes. This will couple to breathing modes kind of thing. So they'll make things bigger and smaller. And uh, if you're looking for continuous gravitational waves, now these are very anisotropic strain fields. So they would, you know, squish and squeeze and squish and squeeze. So if you have modes like this, they will couple very effectively to tensor gravitational fields. And now here, like polarization matters, direction matters, yada yada matters. Here, it doesn't matter if you have things this way or this way or this way. It's going to be this kind of coupling. So, all right. So uh, I'll start with uh, going over the dark matter and the ultralight dark matter and what kind of couplings would give you this type of strain and uh, and take it from there. So uh, I think, did somebody say there's 90 orders of magnitude uncertainty in the composition of dark matter? You did. Oh. <laughs> okay, so there is 90 orders of magnitude uncertainty in the composition of dark matter. It can be a giant black hole for as, uh, I don't know. Probably not just one giant black hole, but uh, but like a few giant black holes, and it can be much, 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 much lighter than neutrino. Everybody has a favorite theory. Everybody has a not so favorite theory. What um, I will be sticking to this uh, 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 
eight-ish EV uh, mass uh, range for dark matter. There's a few well-motivated candidates. And this is uh, the kind of mass region that can be explored by mechanical devices. If you want to go lower, and I think there are a bunch of talks about clocks or atom interferometry, things like that, to you know go low, higher. You, Jake Taylor, you had a talk about you know big, big masses, and I think like those will have to be impulse. And obviously, above that, it has to be something astro. So there we go. Um, for masses, so this is, I'm not, I just wanted to go through this because I want people to realize what kind of hand wavy approximations go in there. This has nothing to do with particle theory. If you have mass less than 10 EV and like mass frequency is just h bar omega equals mc squared, so people just switch things around. Unfortunately, particle physicists like C is one, so you can never do dimensional analysis just to do sanity checks. But anyways, so uh, for masses less than 10 EV, dark matter must be bosonic, or I should say, dark matter in our galaxy close to us must be bosonic because otherwise the Fermi velocity is bigger than the galactic escape velocity, so it won't be there. And we know there's some dark matter around us, or do we? Um, okay, so if, if it is less than one EV, then uh, the interparticle distance becomes uh, comparable to the thermal de Broglie wavelength, which means this bosonic dark matter would start to behave like BEC, and so instead of thinking about them as particles, as we always have, we can easily start thinking about them as a coherent wave, where the frequency is given by the mass, so these are interchangeable, basically. This wave vector has to do with, uh, well, so we are sitting in this dark matter halo, and I'm on Earth, Earth is next to Sun, and they're going around the Milky Way at a speed 10 to the minus 3C. So you can think about it for a detector sitting on Earth. The dark matter wind is going at 10 to the minus 3C. There's some corrections from January to June because Earth is, you know, like your dark matter is in your face, and then in June it's like behind you or something. But uh, but so that's that's the directionality business and frequency. And the amplitude is related to the dark matter energy density, which is believed to be about 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube. But, you know, we don't know. So, so it's, uh, and uh, I like to have a feel for all the numbers. So I was trying to think about what is 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube. And then somebody said to me, a cartoon, and I love it because this is like created for me. Look at that girl's hair. Okay, so <laughs> no one else is allowed to use it. So, <laughs> okay, so basically, if you convert, you know, so point to GV per centimeter cube over the size of the Earth, then convert it to mass would be like mass of one squirrel, you know, over the size of the Earth. So. So, you know, obviously, dark matter is not squirrels, but if it was something like a squirrel, which is in the 90 orders of magnitude mass the uncertainty range, it'll be really cool because you can detect it like using those impulse, uh, you know, sea of pendula way. That'll be the way to detect it. But, uh, and, uh, but, you know, we're focusing on like, wave-like dark matter, which is much, much lighter than the neutrino. And for those kind of dark matter candidates, basically you need precision measurement, long integration times, et cetera, et cetera. But <laughs> OK, so, so, if, uh, so, so now the only thing we know is that dark matter, you know, we know dark matter exists because of its gravitational effects. Everything else is pure spec speculation and, well, like, physically motivated speculation. But, uh, but so let's assume it interacts linearly, because you know it can interact quadratically, tensorly, whatever you want, uh, with standard model particles and field. So you, I have some like field, your favorite particle and field, some coupling constant. And, uh, and if you kind of start expanding it, this is like a little bit of Taylor series expansion, basically uh, discussed very well in this and a few other papers then you can start to absorb this uh, this 
coupling, which is just a number, because we're only looking at scalar couplings, into uh, fundamental constants of nature. So, so these constants would be modulated at the frequency, which is like the mass of your dark matter field. So mass of the electron is changing, alpha is changing, all these numbers are changing, and then we say these changes happen at like Planck scale because you know you have to pick something. And uh, and yeah, so so and then we you know come up with like fractional units, so delta m over m, delta alpha over alpha, and those are the d that show up in all the dark matter plots. So so that's that. So how does it couple to mechanics? Well, if I say alpha is changing, mass of the electron is changing, that means you could also say that the size of an atom is changing at the dark matter frequency. If you have a solid which is made of, you know, bazillions of atoms, and I know bazillion is not a number, but uh, this would lead to a macroscopic strain field. So that's what I mean when I say that uh, a dark matter field which is causing each atom to you know become bigger and smaller is going to make a solid go bigger and smaller and you need breathing modes because um, so this kind of strain would uh, can be modeled as a tidal force so in that sense it's similar to a gravitational wave but except it is it is isotropic it's a number so so this is just a number, unlike gravitational waves where this is a, a tensor and depends on the polarization and stuff. And then the way it, this kind of strain couples to your mechanics depends on the geometry of your mechanics. So um, if we say that this mechanical sensor is limited by thermal noise, tell me Kelvin or so you come up with a factor like this, which has a lot of the usual suspects. Uh, and then this Q is this uh, geometric thing. So if you, you know, pick your favorite optomechanics device, tell me it's eigenfunction, uh, eigenfrequency, effective mass, and Q factor. And I can tell you what's the smallest dark matter strain you can detect. Uh, there is uh, a coherence uh, time associated with this because a dark matter wave would stay coherent up to like 10 to the 6 os oscillations, then it loses the phase coherence, it kind of like resets. And uh, so, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, so basically if you, if you have gigahertz devices, if you're looking at gigahertz dark matter fields, your integration time, I mean, so your scaling would be uh, worse with integration time, basically for smaller, uh, for very long wavelength, for low frequency dark matter stuff, you can, uh, the scaling goes as like square root of uh, integration time. Okay, so, so we looked at a whole bunch of mechanical devices and uh, plotted it all over this. This is the region that has been ruled out by equivalence principle measurements. This is some sort of like, na uh, so below this is some sort of uh, natural parameter space. But uh, it's, uh, it's movable. Um, and uh, so we looked at, uh, so there's only one data point for this kind of coupling, which was given by Weber, Barr, or Riga. They went back and analyzed eight years of their data and uh, said that, oh, this coupling has to be like below this for this particular frequency. So frequency is here and mass is here. And uh, then I looked at like centimeter scale, uh, superfluid helium devices, and uh, so we use uh, and to compare it with a bunch of other systems. I used an integration time of a year, but I would like to say that for some of these systems, you start to enter parameter space that has not been ruled out by EP tests with like one day or a few days of integration time. So, um, so there are quartz bulk acoustic resonators micro pillars, except if they are no longer micro, but more like milli or centipillars, uh, <laughs> and uh, phononic crystal devices, if they are no longer in the gigahertz, it's just not gonna happen, like bigger megahertz-ish. So basically, what I'm finding is that if you want to be in this interesting region, uh, then you need devices that are bigger than millimeter, more centimeter scale stuff. 
uh, cues of, so I just wanted to compare them and have fewer parameters, so I just used Q of 10 to the 9, 10 millikelvin in one year for all of these. And uh, so uh, some general considerations, you know, things we found after making all the mistakes is you need large mass. There is no way around it. You need basically microgrammish or more. So a bunch of atoms and a lot of these things, not going to work. Um, I mean, I'm very interested to know other people's ideas and suggestions. And also, I only want to rule these things out for this particular type of strain coupling. There are other couplings that come from other couplings to like couplings to other standard model particles and fields. So I wouldn't rule them out out just for this particular thing. Okay, and also, as I was alluding to, you need things with free boundaries, so flexural modes and stuff are out. Um, but there's a whole bunch of systems there. We're looking at a few more, and uh, these are interesting times. Um, just want to come to uh, this curve um, and point out that this type of scalar coupling is not being looked at to the best of my knowledge uh, in uh, another experiment. But like I said, there are all types of couplings, and uh, we heard talks about many of them. And uh, they are being looked at by various uh, experiments. And so it's, it's a really good time to be a theorist, and I'm sure also an experimentalist in the field. <gasps> oh, OK, sorry. Yeah, this is this one. I don't know what I did. It's OK, yeah. Yeah, so what was I saying? Yes, this is an interesting time to be a theorist, not because of like all the things I spontaneously do, but uh, but it's, 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 and especially like here, I found all these new experiments that are basically scooping out so much of the parameter space. It's super impressive. It's an interesting time uh, to look at precision measurement systems and not so precision measurement systems to rule out so much of the dark matter parameter space. Okay, so so changing gears a little bit, uh, I will not talk about dark matter anymore. Uh, I'm going to talk about some continuous gravitational wave detection using a specific type of optomechanical system, superfluid helium. And uh, okay, so I mean, uh, I can just skip this slide. Uh, we know gravitational waves exist, but so far the only gravitational waves we have seen are from these binary in spirals of two black holes or two neutron. Has there been a one black hole, one? OK, sorry. Not, and also one black hole, one neutron star. Uh, uh, so basically, binary in spiral last few milliseconds of uh, compact objects. They're the only gravitational waves that have been seen. But there are sources of continuous gravitational waves. Specifically, um, I'll be focusing on pulsars that generate, or technically tiny mountains on pulsars, that generate coherent uh, gravi continuous gravitational waves at very well-defined frequency. So if there is a tiny mountain on a rotating neutron star, then you would have gravitational waves at twice the rotation frequency of the neutron star. So you know exactly what frequency to expect the gravitational wave at. So you can build a narrowband detector, a resonant mass detector, that uh, scans that particular frequency very well. Um, so just to get, well, obviously, the strength of these kind of gravitational waves is going to be much, much smaller than you know, a binary in spiral, which is such um, you know, a lot more violent event. So if you just want to get like an order of magnitude thing, then uh, you pick your favorite pulsar, the crab pulsar, because it you know, has pretty pictures. And uh, if we assume that all the slowdown of crab pulsar, or any pulsar, is converted into gravitational radiation, which we know is not 100% true, um, then the power would be 10 to the 31 watts, which is a lot of power, even to 2 kiloparsecs away. You would have nanowatts per meter square. But you know, if this was light, everybody can see it. 
uh, your detectors would see it uh, pretty straightforward, but it's a gravitational wave. It doesn't do anything except change the, the metric, and it changes the metric by one part in 10 to the minus 24. That's, yes. Sorry, is this the closest? No, I found some closer, but this is uh, the slowdown time is pretty long. Uh, also, it's like popular, it has a name. If I had said like J, one, two, three, four, B, that doesn't have the same ring to it's it. Also VR, right? It's also, yeah, 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 which is why like it, there's so much happening, the slowdown is pretty fast. And uh, yeah, so thank you. But this is why I knew so much about Pulsar. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot of Pulsar astronomy and then never got to use it again. So. <laughs> So yeah, um, so so this guy's so so ten minus twenty four. Ten minus twenty four is less than a millimeter over size of the Milky Way. So you're trying to detect small changes in length of less than a millimeter over the size of Milky Way. Uh, however, it's not super hopeless because that mountain on your pulsar is going to stay there forever. It's not like and over, right? So so you can integrate for longer times and bury your noise floor. And you know what frequency the signal is coming at. And, uh, you know, if you think it's going to, like, you know, frequency flip or something, you can always monitor it using a radio telescope. But this is a bad one, but uh, the millisecond pulsars are going to stay there for relatively forever. Okay, so resonant mass uh, sensor for gravitational waves, it's not a new story. They have been around forever. This is basically the Weber bar. But what we proposed was if you make a Weber bar out of superfluid helium, and as you pointed out, David, it's an amazing material. So uh, you can get away with much smaller masses, which makes seismic and acoustic isolation a lot easier. Because you can have much larger cues and much lower temperatures, there is a huge advantage there. You can use this diet, yes. You can use a, a whole bunch of optomechanical techniques to increase the line width. You can, um, so this uh, basically by using superfluid helium, uh, the elastic modes as uh, your uh, frequencies, basically you can tune the pressure and uh, the frequencies of all your modes, acoustic modes shift. So you have frequency tunability while retaining high Q factor. So you can focus on one pulsar and, you know, hours later focus on another one, just tune your resonance. And uh, the super high Q factors are uh, because uh, of some well-studied process, uh, processes in helium, uh, the losses that uh, Keith Schwab's group looked at were limited by three phonon processes and so this measurement was done at 44 millikelvin. The temperature can go lower. And uh, helium-3 impurities, you can use isotropically pure sample to get much lower cues than what was measured here. And it's, uh, yeah. So, so basically, you're looking at elastic deformations in superfluid helium. And that's what I was saying. You change the pressure inside the container, and all these modes will shift in frequency. And uh, specifically, what I found was, uh, this is what I was kind of talking about earlier, that geometry, what kind of mode you pick matters, especially for tensor strain fields like gravitational waves. So things that look quadrupolary uh, couple strongly to uh, this kind of signal, which, you know, makes sense. Um, okay, so uh, the smallest strain you can detect uh, varies with you know, obviously, so uh, your your dilution fridge temperature, frequency, bigger mass, the better, higher Q factor, the better, longer you integrate, the better, and a whole bunch of things that depend on you know, orientation of your helium bucket with respect to the neutron star and the gravitational wave signal and uh, some other, like, directional parameters, basically. But uh, what we found was um, another th that... For a whole bunch of pulsars, you start to get strain sensitivities uh, comparable to LIGO, things uh, that have been uh, n basically start to get uh, sensitivities that are comparable or better than LIGO and come close to the spin down limit for um, these high frequency millisecond pulsars. So, and obviously integrate longer, get better. 
Uh, I just wanted to show this plot. So this is uh, most of the pulsars that are out there, not all of them from the Manchester catalog, but only the ones LIGO has been focusing on. And uh, a, dete a narrow band detector, and we wanted to look at like higher frequencies, kilohertz or so, uh, would sit somewhere here, uh, where LIGO sensitivity is, well, not so sensitive. And this is the last result. So this is if all the spin down was coming from gravitational waves, this is where the signal would be. Uh, for some things like the crab pulsar, they already got much lower uh, than the limit and they didn't find anything, which was pretty expected, especially for young pulsars like the crab pulsar. For more stable pulsars in this region, the millisecond pulsars, you expect that a lot of the slowdown is indeed because of gravitational radiation, or at least a big fraction of it is. Uh, however, as you can see, like these are more frequency stable, so the frequency is changing at like 10 to the minus 14. Um, so, you know, obviously, if it, all of it is converted to gravitational energy, tiny strains. Uh, however, so, so this is an interesting system. There have been proposals of using other optomechanical systems in the megahertz regime for certain specific uh, gravitational waves. At the, and then there's uh, some weird So I just, it has been difficult for me to find things in the sky that would emit gravitational waves at super high frequencies, right? Like, What's going to happen at a gigahertz? Apparently, two brains can collide, and that, like B R A N E S, the string theory brains. Uh, so, and there will be uh, some signal at gigahertz and stuff. And I'm trying to understand some of this. One interesting source for which you would need a tunable detector is um, so post a neutron star neutron star merger, there will be a continuous wave signal which um, the frequency depends on the two masses involved. And uh, the, there will be a time scale associated with that sine wave. And that will depend on the composition, the details of neutron star. So that would be an interesting, uh, and depending on the masses of the neutron star, it can be you know, like in the high kilohertz or so. So that would be interesting to explore. And I'm starting to look into it. What is the possibility? So that. Yeah. Isn't that like mostly in like? So that's everywhere. I thought like the strength dies down at high frequency. It's mostly like, okay, yeah. Let's let's. I'd be happy to chat more about that. I'm a bit confused about the stochastic. Yeah, it's like. I find it a bit confusing. I'm still. This is like I'm learning so much new physics. Uh, okay, so yes, that's mostly it. Uh, I would like to point out that you know I'm a quantum optics girl, and this whole talk I've only talked to you about classical harmonic oscillators, and not quantum ones. And it would be cool to talk more about quantum. But what I found was you need a lot of mass, and I don't have a clear way of you know, taking like micrograms, milligrams, grams, kilograms of mass into the quantum regime. But I'm listening. <laughs> I'm interested. It'll be great. And there are some issues that come with uh, quantum measurements that everybody knows about. And there are ways to, you know, like work with it. But that's pretty much it. And, uh, you know, you guys know about all that. Uh, but uh, one of the things we are looking into is uh, there, like some other type of dark matter couplings. And also looking at, so what I talked about was a narrow band scheme, like this kind of strain field. If the frequency at which this modulation is happening is the dark matter frequency is equal to the resonance, mechanical resonance frequency, the signal would be super amplified. So this is a resonant detection scheme for dark matter. But if you have like ridge boundaries and stuff, you will have a uniform pressure modulation at that frequency. And there are some parametric techniques to detect like a little bump of pressure modulation. So we're looking at some of these bar band schemes. Uh, always happy to discuss other astrophysical particle physics sources for weak forces. 
you know, uh, I think for the systems I looked at, it's a pretty straightforward uh, thing to just stay classical. But, you know, if they go quantum, I'm more than happy to go quantum with them. Um, so finally, I just want to say thank you to all the people who worked on these projects with me. The gravitational wave detection was with the experimental group of uh, Keith Schwab, and Laura DeLorenzo was the person who did some of the early experiments. Igor taught me some GR. He's not here, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm working with John Davis's group about uh, some uh, different designs, uh, quadrupolar type, like Helmholtz resonator style designs for more efficient uh, gravitational wave uh, sensing. Uh, the scalar dark matter detection has been primarily the work of one of my students, Jack Manley, in the audience. Rustam just started uh, in the group and is, you know, one month old, so he's like mostly, like he's just figuring things out. Uh, and uh, I worked with Delzio Wilson's group as, you know, my experimental fact checker. No, this is not possible. This is possible. Well, you could do this. And so it has been fun to work with his group. And uh, Daniel Grin, who is a colleague in particle astrophysics, who has been teaching me a lot of particle astrophysics. But it's still mostly like, wait, what? I don't understand. But like we're starting to speak some same language. But I can see that there is a whole bunch of projects along these lines now that we're starting to understand each other. So. So it's, uh, it's really exciting. Uh, thank you for organizing a workshop like this. I learned a lot of new things. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, buddy. In your introductory motivational slide, you listed three kind of naturalness problems. What's What's your sense as somebody who you've, you've announced yourself as relatively new to thinking about these things? To what extent do you think those are really problems? And to what, what extent do you think those are Like, excuses? they're problems because we haven't solved them. So Do they, need, do they actually need solutions? But or I'd like to know more, wouldn't you? <laughs> like, don't you wonder, like, why is gravity so weak? I don't know. I would like to know. Why, like, how badly can we not understand cosmological constant? I mean, 10 to the 120, that is... I'm less sure that's a problem. Why? How is that not a problem? That's like a super shameful problem for a theorist. It's like, I came up with a theory, it's only off by 120 orders of magnitude. Can you imagine that, like, if you had an experiment, you were off by a factor of 20, you'd be like, go away, don't talk to me, right? Like. This is not even 20 on a log scale, so. So I think that, I just think there's a lot of new physics. You know, I come from a community where we were counting every quanta and every h bar omega mattered to a great extent to everybody. And all the theory curves and experimental curves like lined up beautifully. And the more I learn about this, it's like, wow, people really don't know. And uh, I mean, I don't need to say, I, I don't want to say it like in a bad way, but it's just interesting because there are so many open questions. That's what I meant, like there is so much parameter space to scoop out. You don't really need to be in that QCD ribbon, whatever the name for that is. But um, you can be anywhere above, and there are legitimate theories that you can start ruling out. That's That's what I... I have my name on papers like that, too. <laughs> uh, I'm sort of proud of, so I agree. But do you think we learn anything about gravity by, uh, by trying to understand those 120 orders of magnitude in, uh, in the zero point? I, like, I don't think we will. Okay, so so the motivation to point out that problem, apart from, like, I just find it comical, um, was that um, a lot of this... Um, fundamental constant modulation theories, like theories that give you these modulations as a corollary, uh, come from string theories like, uh, that give you these uh, vacuum fluctuations, that give you these bosonic fields, the dilettantes and moduli, and uh, you know precision measurement experiments, the EDM ones, and few others. 
that are ruling things out, um, that's the kind of theory parameter space that is being ruled out. So if you look at you know, the scoop out of you know, the key kawa stuff and stuff, you'll see that there'll be a line for the delta and the moduli and stuff. So we are ruling things out. Uh, does that help? I don't know. I don't know, but I do think that it would be good to rule something out. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, that's it. So if you give me a Q of 10 to the 20, I can tell you you can get away with smaller mass. If you can, I don't know, integrate for years and years and decades, I can tell you you can get away with smaller mass. If you want to start ruling out things have, that have not been ruled out by EP tests that are below that line, and you want to rule it out in like a day, a week, then you want micrograms or more. But if you are okay with you know not doing that, then you don't need micrograms, and you can just get away with nanograms, so or less. Yes, so it's the same scale, right? Like like the square root n scale. Yes, you can have n detectors. I didn't want to do that because it is very difficult to have two mechanical systems of exactly the same frequency, or n mechanical systems of exactly the same frequency. It's just a fabrication issue. Uh, but yeah, like theoretically, it doesn't hurt me. n. Our n is like so many that you can get away with much smaller masses. So, but I thought that that was not fair. <laughs> but yeah, we, you're absolutely right. Square root n, scaling. For gravity stuff, and I think even for some dark matter stuff, you should have more than one detector, just so you rule out, or like some geographically displaced detector, you know, the same concept as like. So. Is there any extra status on the resonant gravitational wave detector? Well, uh, Experimentally. Keith and I talked after many months last week. He's alive and fine. Uh, I, so, um, Yes, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> this, oh my God, this is really right. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing great. Um, but uh, no, they, uh, we've been talking about some stuff, but mostly uh, John Davis's group, because I talked about how, so for this helium stuff, one of the reasons the Q was that high was I stuck to a cylinder mm. because I wanted to, because that's the kind of geometry they looked at and that's the kind of geometry like I knew the analytical solutions to. But what I found was uh, there is a huge geometric improvement if you go to slightly different geometries, like things that go like this. Or maybe a levitated sphere. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. But you need this type of modes in that as well, and there are sloshing modes like that. So, so that's so so that's what John Davis's group is looking at. They want to like inject strains like this and measure it. And also, one of the reasons was in that case, the transducer converting the mechanical system to an electrical signal was the bucket that the helium was in, and it doesn't have to be like that. So they have this other transducer which is basically like a membrane, aluminum foil or something, and uh, and then it's part of like a capacitor plate, basically. So so when the pressure is modulated locally, you can measure that. So so that was cool, and and they are like slapping things together, and we're working with with their group. So okay. so it's in progress. Um, I don't think that particular system is going to have super high cues, but it's more to look at like. Can you have a detector of these type of strengths? And uh, so there's, so there, there's work happening, and I'd be interested in helium droplets for for both of these things. So, because yeah, 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 yeah. So I talked very briefly to him. The problem with helium droplets is, like, it's analytically so difficult because. It's actual Navier-Stokes equations. There's the convection terms and stuff. So it's just. Theoretically, 
it's, it's a little challenging, but you know, it's being resolved. It's being resolved, and and there, I, I know there is some like cool surface modes. There, there, there is work to be done. It's an interesting system to look into for these kind of measurements. And I mean, you would agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. He would agree more. So. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Thank you so much.